Our guest tonight joins us from New Hampshire. Daniel Benjamin is the director of the John Sloan Dickey Centre for International Understanding at Dartmouth College. He was, until 2012, ambassador at large and coordinator for counterterrorism at the US State Department. In that role, he was the principal advisor to Secretary of State Hillary Clinton on counterterrorism. Welcome to Late Line, Daniel Benjamin. Thank you for having me. We've seen these disturbing images of what's claimed to have been the murder of 1,700 members of the Iraqi army. ISIS has boasted that their victims were all Sunnis. Is the ambition here genocide? I think the ambition is uh, full-blown sectarian warfare uh, along the lines uh, that were foreseen were forecast uh, years ago by really the grandfather of uh, ISIS, the founder of ISIS, um, uh, uh, Zarqawi, who believed that the best strategy for the Sunnis in Iraq was to force a sectarian war and to uh, uh, achieve the dissolution of modern Iraq. And uh, mass killing, mass atrocity is certainly uh, uh, a, a way to that end. Um, genocide, I don't think, is exactly what they think of themselves as uh, searching for, striving for, uh, but they are prepared to kill enormous numbers of people to achieve their goals. Who are these ISIS fighters? Where did they come from? How did they manage, in such relatively small numbers, to overwhelm Iraqi troops and police with such ease? Well, uh, again, the uh, uh, ISIS was born of Al Qaeda of Iraq, which was founded uh, after the invasion uh, of Iraq in 2003. It arose as a response to uh, the occupation. I think that's fairly clear. And um, uh, there are uh, outside fighters, foreign fighters, who have joined ISIS, uh, but they are primarily in Syria. I think the fighters that we're seeing in Iraq are overwhelmingly Iraqi, and uh, they have answered the call of uh, a radical Islamism, of a jihadist creed, uh, in ways that uh, others in occupied countries have and that others uh, around the Arab world have. And they have been particularly good at recruiting because of the sectarian divide that keeps uh, opening more and more widely uh, in Iraq. Now, the reason they've been able to succeed as well as they have with uh, this latest uh, offensive is because of the hollowing uh, and, and systemic weakness of the Iraqi army. Uh, Nouri al-Maliki, the prime minister of Iraq, has seen uh, the army that was largely created by the United States after the invasion as more of a threat to him and to his authority than he has as a tool for uh, a unitary national state in Iraq. And uh, he purged lots of generals. He's uh, in, ensured that they didn't get uh, the resources they needed. And uh, as a result, it's a very weak army with very poor morale. It never achieved the kinds of uh, integration of the different communities uh, in Iraq uh, that the United States hoped for. So uh, it's not surprising that the uh, army melted away when uh, faced with some very determined, very fierce uh, fighters from um, uh, ISIS. I want to talk specifically about the Prime Minister and the Army in a moment, but first I wanted to ask you about Tony Blair's comments over the weekend where he claimed that the violence in Iraq was the result of the West's failure to intervene in Syria. Now, what's your view on that? Well, I'm a great admirer of Tony Blair's, but I think on this one um, he's partially right but not uh, wholly right. There's a question that the civil war in Syria has been uh, decisive in terms of giving uh, ISIS the, uh, um, the resources, the capability, the manpower it needs to carry on this kind of two-front war that it is uh, prosecuting right now. Uh, at the same time, uh, it's important to, to understand that the invasion of Iraq in 2003 fundamentally changed the equilibrium in the Middle East between Sunni and Shia. And there were already very tense relations between these two communities. And uh, the notion that Iraq, despite the fact that it was ruled by a Sunni minority and by one of the worst despots of modern times, 
uh, the, fa the, the notion that Iraq would move from the Sunni category to the Shia category and be dominated, or at least highly influenced, dominated is too strong a word, highly influenced by Iran uh, was anathema to uh, many leaders in the region and certainly to many uh, uh, people, including very wealthy ones, who could support a rebellion. So uh, Prime Minister Blair, I think, uh, overstates the case. Now, he comes up with lots of hypotheticals in his article about what the world would look like now if Saddam Hussein were still in power and the Arab Spring had happened. And the fact is these kinds of counterfactuals are impossible to really think through because uh, history is so unpredictable, events are so unpredictable. Um, the changing of the equilibrium in the region had an absolutely critical watershed uh, impact on, on uh, the events that we're seeing today. Now, ISIS has taken a significant swathe of land, most of the northeast of Syria, including oil fields, Iraq's second biggest city and much of the country's northwest now. The question is, can they hold that land? I guess the better question may be, will they be left with that land in some sense? Because uh, ISIS is, uh, is a small organization. We're talking about thousands of people, not hundreds of thousands. They don't have the wherewithal to turn uh, this area, which some are calling Sunnistan, from uh, sort of central Iraq into uh, the Syrian heartland. They don't have anything like the wherewithal to govern it. They do have the ability to go into cities, uh, pillage them, carry out atrocities, remove money, remove weapons, and to move on, and to come back from time to time to uh, carry out uh, revenge killings or to make uh, examples of people who they feel are not uh, heeding their uh, directives. Uh, so what I think we're facing right now is um, an ungoverned zone uh, from uh, Sunni western uh, uh, Iraq, uh, central and western Iraq, well into uh, Syria. Uh, now, uh, if the U.S. Uh, or others were to carry out airstrikes against uh, ISIS, and it's not clear that that can be done easily because these are very tough, moving, small targets. Uh, it might drive them back a bit. It might uh, cause a, a pause in all this. Um, but I am not certain that we're going to see the Iraqi uh, army reconstituting or even any of the Shiite militias uh, moving far into the Sunni heartland to uh, fight this. I think they want to protect uh, Baghdad. They want to protect the holy cities of Najaf and Karbala. Uh, and uh, ensure that their communities are uh, safe. I think what we're seeing here is uh, more ethnic cleansing, which has been going on in Iraq since 2003, more separation. Now, you were the head of counterterrorism at the US State Department in 2011 when the decision was made to withdraw all US troops from Iraq. What did you know about ISIS at that point? Well, I'm not sure we even knew uh, the name ISIS at that point. I think we were still facing al-Qaeda in Iraq. It was only, I believe, in 2012, uh, or we knew the name, but we saw it as al-Qaeda in Iraq. It, in 2012, uh, we designated uh, a group called Jabhat al-Nusra as, um, uh, as an AKA, as a, uh, another name for al-Qaeda in Iraq uh, that was fighting in Syria. Uh, and that was a central participant in the Syrian civil war. Uh, ISIS has, be, has come to prominence uh, when it disowned Jabhat al-Nusra uh, for not following its directives. Uh, but we knew all along that al-Qaeda in Iraq uh, was an al-Qaeda affiliate that was uh, really pursuing its own course, that was largely disregarding direction from uh, Pakistan, from the uh, uh, al-Qaeda senior leadership, and that was pursuing a far more sectarian uh, uh, approach uh, to warfare than, uh, than the al-Qaeda senior leadership felt comfortable with. Uh, now, there have been various flare-ups when ISIS was moving into cities uh, and causing mayhem, particularly in Anbar province, uh, and we saw that earlier this year in Fallujah and Ramadi. Uh, and we knew that this was a very brutal group, uh, but again, what has really turbocharged the situation, if you will, 
is the uh, war in Syria, which has drawn enormous resources to the region, uh, contributions from uh, wealthy Sunnis, particularly in the Persian Gulf, but also from some governments in the region that didn't want to see uh, Syria uh, stay in the Shia column. Now, Syria is run by an Alawite minority, uh, but it is uh, closely allied with Iran uh, and is certainly not considered a Sunni state. So uh, all of this has been uh, raising, uh, raising the pressure, raising the temperature in this, in this region. And ISIS, with its particularly vicious uh, uh, ideology, uh, has been benefiting from that uh, heightened tension. Now let's talk about Nouri al-Maliki, the Prime Minister you left behind in Iraq. He's a Shia, as we mentioned. To what extent did the Obama administration weigh the risk that he might increasingly isolate the Sunni population and they would, in turn, as they have, revolted? Uh, the Obama administration was speaking to Maliki in uncertain terms for quite a long time uh, about the need to be more inclusive uh, in terms of governance. But I think it's very important to recognize that from the time before President Obama came into office, from the time really that uh, President Bush set the timeline for withdrawal, uh, U.S. leverage in Iraq uh, was diminishing. And the ability to influence the government uh, was uh, less and less, you know, with every passing month. And in addition, you know, you mentioned the withdrawal of the troops. Uh, the I Iraqis made it absolutely plain that they did not want a residual force left behind. And uh, I have to say that this was something that was viewed with great concern from very early on uh, within the government. And there was a sense that our, our ability to uh, have any influence on uh, on the army, on the government, uh, was uh, going to be uh, quite minimal. Well, what of the claims that the U.S. left too soon? Well, uh, you know, I think that uh, that is a uh, often being used as a partisan uh, attack. Uh, the uh, the United States had acknowledged the sovereignty of uh, Iraq and was transferring the powers of governance back to Iraq well before President Obama came into power. Uh, the United States, uh, I suppose, could have taken a different approach from much earlier on and tried to have, uh, you know, a generational occupation uh, or generational presence in Iraq. But the American people didn't want that, and certainly the Iraqis. Uh, didn't want that, and certainly the Iranians didn't want that. And it's important to remember that some of these Shia militia that are uh, being mustered now or being enhanced now to go and fight against the Sunnis uh, were actively killing American troops on the ground who were there uh, trying to uh, establish peace and uh, protect the Shia uh, community in Iraq. So the United States faced uh, an impossible situation. Uh, I think in hindsight we all wish that uh, the Maliki government had agreed to a, a SOFA agreement, a stationing of forces agreement uh, with the U.S. that would have left behind uh, a group and one that, uh, a, a U.S. force and one that was particularly uh, focused on uh, counterterrorism, uh, advising and training and counterinsurgency. But uh, the Maliki government would have none of it and they're paying the price for that now. Now, there seems to be little coherence in the American foreign policy strategy in the Middle East. Saddam Hussein was toppled on the belief that he had weapons of mass destruction. Bashar al-Assad has actually used uh, chemical weapons in Syria but remains in power. Now the White House is talking about doing a deal with their sworn enemy, Iran, which threatens to inflame tensions elsewhere in the Middle East. How does the US, in your view, regain credibility in the region? Uh, well, I think the U.S. has a fair amount of credibility in the region. I would uh, say, first of all, that um, I opposed the invasion of Iraq uh, well before it happened. Um, I had worked in the Clinton White House uh, as director for counterterrorism at the National Security Council staff, and I knew there was no connection between Saddam Hussein and al-Qaeda, and I wrote that in the New York Times in September of 2002, and I continue to believe that the invasion of Iraq uh, was possibly the greatest error in American foreign policy history. 
Um, the invasion of Iraq was also a direct consequence of the strategic shock that the United States uh, uh, experienced after 9-11, uh, which was uh, the most stunning attack on the U.S. mainland uh, since, uh, you know, the British invaded, reinvaded in, uh, uh, in the War of 1812. So there was, in a sense, a complete confusion and a vacuum of ideas of how to deal with this. And uh, a coterie of people, including around President Bush, including President Bush, believed that uh, a show of power by the U.S. in the Middle East would sort things out and that uh, Saddam Hussein was an intolerable presence who needs to be uh, removed. I thought this was uh, a huge mistake, and uh, we've paid for it ever since. I think right now the course forward is going to be very difficult for the United States because, in part because of the removal of that, that disequilibrium, that upsetting of all the balances in the region, and because of the, uh, the broader conflict between Sunnis and Shia, uh, and uh, the kind of warfare we see in Syria, the United States uh, even with the best of intentions, wouldn't have the wherewithal to sort all this out. And as we know, occupation carries with it enormous uh, problems and has a radicalizing impact, and it will drive people uh, to become anti-American, to become either jihadi or Shia uh, uh, anti-American. And so I think we have uh, a limited set of capabilities here, a set of options, and uh, we may have a strong interest in containing this new, uh, this new safe haven for terrorists that stretches uh, across so much of the region from Syria into Iraq. Uh, but I don't think that we have uh, the ability to nation build any, any further to uh, in any way reset uh, the situation in Iraq. Uh, we may be able to help keep the country uh, from greater dissolution, although my own sense is that the Shia militias will prevent uh, the uh, uh, Sunni extremists from progressing further into uh, Shia uh, Iraq. So I think the country will hold together, at least a rump uh, Iraq will hold together. And uh, the parties are going to have to decide whether or not they want to continue fighting uh, or want to have uh, a unitary nation. And uh, I think it's an open question whether uh, they are capable of having that kind of dialogue and making that kind of decision. Daniel Benjamin, we're out of time. I thank you very much for joining us tonight. It's been my pleasure.